Well, hi, everybody. I'm so happy to be here with an amazing panel uh, to have a great discussion on the ways collaboration is happening during this pandemic. Nothing, of course, that we've been seeing during this pandemic is business as usual, and, and this is just another example. Uh, so the folks we have on the panel are uh, Stefan Bonsell, the CEO of Moderna, uh, Rajiv Venkaya, who is the president of uh, the Global Vaccine Business Unit at uh, Takeda, and uh, Pompey Young, who is the Chief Medical Officer of Biomedical Services at the American Red Cross. And I, th I thought start to, we'd start with just sort of setting the foundation for how uh, each of these folks is working and their organizations are working um, on COVID-19. Uh, Stefan, why don't we start with you, just kind of catch us up to what Moderna has been doing in case folks haven't heard. Well, good afternoon, Meg, and good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for having us. So uh, as you know, we're in the final stage of a phase three study. Uh, we are, as we shared recently, uh, expecting the interim analysis to happen in November. It's not a precise exact date because it depends on the efficacy of a vaccine, which of course we don't know. That's why we're doing a phase three. And also depends on the attack rate, the number of cases which we are counting. Our first interim analysis is 53 cases. And we are also working really hard uh, to make as uh, much product as we can, assuming success. Because of course, it would be very sad if a vaccine gets approved because it's safe and efficacious and we don't have any product. So we've said that uh, our goal is this year to make around 20 million doses. Uh, and as we said next year, 500 million up to a billion doses, depending on how much raw material we can get for supply. Great, thank you. And Rajiv, um, talk to us about you know Takeda, but also you're involved in many of these groups, CEPI, IAVI, uh, so you've got a lot uh, of experience to speak from. Um, so tell us about you. Sure. Thanks. Thanks, Meg. And uh, thanks for having me here today. I um, bring a, a slightly different background from uh, somebody who's, uh, who's in industry. I'm, I'm running the vaccine business at Takeda now, but previously was at the Gates Foundation um, overseeing vaccine delivery activities. And prior to that, uh, at the White House, where I oversaw pandemic and biodefense preparedness and I'm a, a pulmonary and critical care doc by training. Uh, my current involvement, uh, though, as you, as you mentioned, extends to uh, serving on the board of CEPI. And CEPI, as I think uh, most people know, is a coalition for epidemic preparedness innovations that is a, a large multilateral funder of vaccine development for epidemic threats. And it just so happens that CEPI was launched in 2017 at Davos, uh, almost three years to the day before uh, SARS-CoV-2 was recognized as a big problem. And in fact, in that third week of January, CEPI announced its first three funded programs to tackle the SARS-CoV-2 virus. So I'm, uh, I'm connected to those activities. Within Takeda, we aren't developing our own uh, uh, vaccine for SARS-CoV-2, but we are partnering with one company called Novavax uh, to transfer the technology for manufacturing of their COVID vaccine into Japan to supply the Japanese population. And we are in discussions with uh, with a colleague here, Stefan, about potentially helping to distribute Moderna's vaccine in uh, Japan, although those, those discussions are ongoing. I just will quickly point out that at Takeda, we've uh, reoriented much of our R&D enterprise to this beyond vaccines. We are looking at a number of our products to see if any of them could be repurposed to uh, tackle uh, SARS-CoV-2 as a therapeutic. And we also have initiated a very innovative partnership in the plasma space where we are working with other plasma producers to develop a hyperimmune globulin, uh, pooling our plasma collection abilities to produce a single unbranded plasma mm -hmm. antibody solution to tackle uh, those who are sick with SARS-CoV-2. A lot there. Um, Pompey, tell us about the American Red Cross and COVID. Hi, everyone. Um, hi, Meg. Thank you for... Uh, letting me participate in this. Um, so the Red Cross is uh, the single largest provider of blood uh, and services uh, around blood products in this country. Um, and as part of that, uh, when FDA came out with uh, investigational protocols uh, for use of COVID-19 convalescent plasma uh, back in uh, late March, we were able to stand up our program in a matter of three weeks um, and uh, 
uh, really up to until now have been supporting the various investigational new protocols uh, with COVID convalescent plasma and have distributed over 35,000 units of uh, COVID convalescent plasma um, through the help of the, and the generosity uh, over uh, 12,000 uh, new donors, uh, which involved 20,000 collections across our, 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 the country and our organization. Um, uh, as uh, many of you know, uh, back in late August, uh, the uh, FDA provided emergency use authorization status to COVID convalescent plasma. So right now we're in the process of um, ensuring that we are able to make those changes uh, that are stipulated in the EUA, uh, but continue to collect uh, COVID uh, convalescent plasma. Um, when we started, the rate of infection was about less than 1% in our country. And so getting those donors to donate was, was a real challenge because there are so few uh, really eligible donors. That has improved a little bit, <clears throat> but it continues to be a challenge. So um, thank you. And of course we have a great partnership with Takeda uh, with re regard to um, plasma and plasma products. A lot of questions for you on that. I'm, I'm going to start with Stefan, actually, just on some news of the day. Um, there's a lot of focus being paid today on the FDA's guidelines around an emergency use authorization uh, for vaccines for COVID. Um, the New York Times reporting the White House has blocked the FDA from releasing these guidelines, but they appear to have communicated to the companies what the guidelines are. We heard from Peter Marks from the FDA yesterday speaking with JAMA. Um, and the FDA released um, its briefing documents ahead of an advisory committee meeting that's being held October 22nd on vaccines today, which is earlier than they typically release these, these documents. Stefan, what can you tell us about the guidance you've heard from the FDA and what it means for your timing for potentially filing? Yes, uh, so the FDA has been working very closely with a lot of advisors to figure out how to do an EUA for the vaccine, because I think it's important uh, to know that there has not been uh, an EUA before approved for a vaccine. And so uh, because you vaccinate healthy people, safety is, of course, priority number one. And so I think uh, the FDA has spent a lot of time trying to figure out kind of what's the right way to do it. And what we've heard from FDA recently is that, uh, of course, they want to see efficacy data. This has been made very clear by FDA uh, since back, I think, in June where they said that they do not intend to approve a product for EUA or BLA based on neutralizing antibody. They want to see efficacy data in a 50, 50 placebo control phase three, which is what everybody is running. And having clear guidelines is very helpful to industry. Uh, if not, you don't know what you're already solving for. So we like having clarity because then we can just uh, pull up our sleeve and do the work to, to get to those guidelines. Um, and so it's really the question was around, around safety because if you wait for a full safety study, then it's a BLA, it's not an EUA. And I think the question we're all wrestling with is, depending on the data, and that's why I want to go back to, it will depend on the data of the interim analysis. Because as can, one can imagine, if the efficacy was 60%, or the efficacy was 100% in the elderly, the group at the highest risk, the path forward might look very different. Uh, and this is why it's very hard today to be very precise about what will happen because we don't know the data. Uh, and so I think uh, Dr. Marx has been very clear in uh, several uh, uh, testimony or, or, or interviews he has given. We say that we will have to look at the data and I think that's all of us scientists do and clinicians, which is we have to understand the data for each vaccine in different subpopulation potentially uh, because if the EUA is to be addressed to a small subset of population, let's say healthcare worker and or the elderly, again, what is the age cutoff? Is it 75 or 65? Uh, this will have to depend on the data because getting an EUA for an elderly population, if you don't have data in the elderly, doesn't make too much scientific sense. And so I think this is what the FDA is trying to solve for is to give enough guidance. And one of the guidance was they would like to see two months of safety data after the boost for half of the study size. So in our case, it's a 30,000 phase three study as well set as a guidance from FDA in June. And so if you look at our 15,000 
participant mark, we pass that mark uh, on September 24th. Uh, and we update, as you know, make every Friday the number of participants, the, the diversity, which is very important. And so that's a two more clock. But again, is that two more clock set in stone? I don't know. And I think the efficacy will really dictate it because again, if it's 100% efficacy or 90% efficacy vaccine, there's going to be a lot of ethical questions that clinicians will have to ask themselves in terms of what is the right thing to do to move forward. So just to follow up quickly on that point, I mean, if are you suggesting that if your efficacy looks so strong, let's say you have 90% success in blocking the infection or blocking severe disease, are you suggesting that it might um, mean that regulators will say, this is important enough, we're not going to wait the two months since the second dose? I'm not saying anything. The FDA will have to say what they determine is the right decision to make. What I'm saying is, I'm trying to explain is that depending on the data we're all going to see when we have that data is there might be different outcomes. So I think the two more safety, the way I, 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 I've heard it in the past, it's, it's a guideline uh, for the, the committee that will advise the agency. And again, I take very extreme efficacy numbers just to make people realize that, of course, between a 60% efficacy vaccine or 95% efficacy vaccine, especially if the data is in the elderly, if you have shown in the phase three that you can prevent disease or severe disease or hospitalization in the elderly, that is an important thing to know. And I can anticipate that the clinicians will want, because we're still losing you know, 700 to 1,000 people a day just in this country. That's a lot of people dying every day. So waiting a few more weeks, uh, if you have very strong efficacy, it might not be the right ethical thing to do. And again, it is not my prerogative. It's going to be the advisory committee of the FDA to decide what we pledge. And as you remember, Meg Ruan of company, we pledge to not submit to the regulator for an EUA or BLA until we put the totality of the data, manufacturing, safety, efficacy, was meaningful enough that it could provide benefit to American citizen safety. And so when that sort of two month guidance came out, you were at the FT, or I guess on Zoom talking with the FT, I always think maybe you're in person, but nobody's in person these days. Um, and you said, you know, because of that timing and the halfway enrollment uh, being September 24th, that would essentially mean you're not filing for EUA until November 24th. Uh, is that the, the timing we should be looking at? Again, I think it will depend on the data. So I go back. If we have 98% efficacy in the elderly, we will have a dialogue with the agency, which we have for every product. It is not special to this vaccine. This is what Rajiv does and everybody does, is you go with data. The FDA is made of professional scientists and clinicians and statisticians who look at the data and will have a dialogue of what is the right thing to do. The FDA will be held by the uh, advisory committee, which I think is a very good setup. Uh, and that's what we have to do. So speculating now without seeing data is a hard thing to do for, 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 for what we do in our business. Yeah, okay, I'll let you breathe for a minute and I'll bring in Rajiv. Uh, you know, I'm curious to know your, your thoughts on this, uh, both in the position that you're in, but, uh, but also through positions that you've held before. You were a, an advisor at the White House on biosecurity. Uh, you focused on these issues. How do you look at this and what, companies should do, what the FDA should do, what the White House should do in this context of ensuring trust in this vaccine? I think the, the two top priorities are transparency and objectivity. And this is the reason that the FDA will use an external body of experts to review and advise on the data and the conclusions that one can reach. On the other side, the companies have taken the extraordinary step, those that are developing a, a SARS-CoV-2 vaccine, and I, I have to say I'm a, an arm's length removed from this because our company is not developing our own vaccine, so I can kind of say whatever, whatever I want, you don't have to worry that I'm conflicted, um, that, that the companies have come out and said that they're going to adhere to very strict standards of scientific rigor, and they're committed to transparency as well. And so I think you have um, this, uh, you know, universal commitment amongst those who are working in vaccines that anything we do that would undermine confidence in assessments of safety and efficacy and approvals of vaccines is not only bad for COVID vaccines, it's bad for all vaccines. And it's hard to recover from a loss of confidence in something like vaccines, which we're giving to healthy people, often healthy children, and where we must maintain the highest standards uh, of safety and efficacy. Now, as Stefan has said in, in a couple of different ways, 
there may be instances where uh, the benefit risk equation in certain populations allows you to uh, may, warrants giving early access before you have all of the information you'd normally like to have before giving a vaccine. And in, in high risk populations, that might be the case if the vaccine is in that population shown to be very, very effective. But again, it's a bit of a hypothetical until you actually have the data in hand. Yeah. And maybe just to add to, to Rashid's point, Meg, if I can, I mean, as you know, I think Rajiv is 100% right. You know, transparency is very important. As you know, we were the first company to publish our phase three protocol, which is not done usually. And the only goal we are solving for is trust and transparency and having the scientific and the clinical community be able to look at the protocol and different protocols uh, as others followed our lead. It was interesting to see the different endpoints. And, uh, and I think it's really important. This is not normal times. Uh, and we care deeply. I mean, all those companies that are working hard and all our suppliers and partners uh, want a safe vaccine to get to the market to stop this awful pandemic. Uh, not only about the, the health cost, but also the economic cost in so many families is awful. Uh, it would be so sad for all of us that have worked nonstop. You know, some of my team members have not had one day of holiday since January, fully all nighters and working weekends. If the vaccines were not used and if they were safe and efficacious, that would be so sad. You know, Meg, I, I, I'll, and I'll come in, and then I'm going to let you go back to, to asking questions. But, you know, you know, one of the interesting things about the Moderna decision to publish their protocol and then several other companies to do the same is that this has created a level of disclosure and detail, made detail available to external experts. Like, I mean, I know you're active on Twitter. Eric Topol has written extensively about, you know, deconstructing these phase three protocols and comparing them and talking about the pros and cons. Transparency is a good thing here because you can have experts that are uninvolved come in and, and share with the public their expert views on what exactly is happening. And I think that's the kind of approach we really need throughout this entire process. Good points. And Pompey, I'd like to bring you in and ask you about something that you know has also been in the political crosshairs and convalescent plasma. Can you sum up for us what the data say about how well this works um, for COVID-19? Sure, uh, it absolutely has been uh, politicized. Um, so far, uh, the the data coming out of the Mayo Clinic expanded use protocol, uh, which uh, is really the largest body of data uh, that we have right now published uh, have shown a couple of things. One is that uh, there's a, a clear benefit to receiving this uh, earlier. Uh, so those uh, patients who received it three days from diagnosis uh, did better than those that received it four days or later. Um, and then the second uh, observation uh, was that uh, there was a dose effect. And this is actually a pretty important uh, finding uh, that, uh, that those that received products with lower titers uh, of uh, neutralizing antibody um, did not as well as the, the, those that got higher titers. Um, I think uh, the big shortcoming here is that there was no control group. Uh, so you're comparing, you know, one group of patients who received plasma to another group of patients who received plasma. Um, so the, the data from a randomized control trial is clearly lacking, but I think what was used were, were those uh, aspects that I just described. The fact that after 20,000 transfusions, there's relatively reliable safety data with regard to this product. Um, and then finally, uh, when you take the case series and the non and the aborted randomized control trials coming out of China and uh, the other publications in total, uh, it all points to a positive efficacy signal. Um, so I think that uh, those were used in total for the FDA to, to grant the emergency use authorization. Clearly, uh, if you're in the camp that randomized control trial data are absolutely needed, it's insufficient. Meg, if I could just um, <clears throat> bridge from that to uh, the concept of hyperimmune globulin, because these are related but, but different concepts. Convalescent plasma involves taking plasma from one, one individual and giving it to another individual. So you do um, encounter potentially variability in antibody, the nature of the antibody uh, and the quantity that you see uh, uh, from donor to donor. 
Um, the convalescent, uh, I'm sorry, the hyperimmune uh, approach takes many donors plasma um, that have donors that have recovered from COVID-19 and pools that. And so you have a single large volume that is then separated into, into doses. All of the, the doses are equivalent essentially from that batch. And so along with the, the viral, viral inactivation and removal protocols and so on. So there are, there are some important differences there. We don't have clinical data yet on hyperimmune globulin. We will have that soon. But uh, I just want to draw the distinction between that and hyperimmune globulin, which I, and, and, and convalescent serum, because you know they both have have promise. So when you say soon, what does that mean for data? Yeah, I think I would. Uh, you know, it depends on on enrollment, and and there are some complexities there. But before the end of this calendar year, I would expect that we'll have clinical data on efficacy in a randomized control trial of hyperimmune globulin in COVID nineteen. So Rajiv, I think that uh, just a question about the, the data, uh, the, the clinical trial, it's in, um, uh, I believe, uh, or you can correct me, uh, in, in uh, elderly patients in nursing homes, is that right? Um, because I think that could be an important distinction is that we're studying very different population. The majority of the data in convalescent plasma is in the severely and critically ill. Uh, but it seems like, you know, the monoclonal antibody trials, as well as the hyperimmune uh, globulin trials seem to be focusing on a less ill population. Yeah, I, I, and I actually don't have the entry criteria in front of me on the trial. I do think that your point, the point that you're making about looking carefully at what study population you've evaluated in is very relevant to ultimate indications for the product, for sure. That's really interesting. Stefan, I actually just want to ask you about something that Pompey just said about the, the titers of antibodies. You know, what they've seen in the convalescent plasma trial data, does that tell you anything about the likelihood of your vaccine working? So every time antibodies work in human, all of us making vaccines uh, feel better because uh, as Dr. Fauci has said many times, you know, neutralizing antibody is very important for infectious disease. Uh, and uh, you see more and more data showing that high level of neutralizing antibody is impactful clinically. The piece that I love about vaccines is you don't make one or two antibodies. Your immune system is such a powerful machine. When you get vaccinated, you're gonna make a soup of antibodies. And that's why I think it's a very exciting about the possibility of those vaccines being protective. As you know, we published in the New England Journal of Medicine, you know, full protection in a, in a non-human primate model. Uh, where we showed, you know, no viral load in the lung and a tiny bit of viral load in the nose right after the challenge, where basically you put 10 to the 6 copies of a virus in the nose. So you see it for a few days and then you see no more in the nose. So uh, that, that's quite hopeful. So between the human data on, on covalescent or recombinant antibodies like Nolilis or Regeneron uh, and the vaccine preclinical model, we are cautiously optimistic. Well, I wonder, Rajiv and Pompey, um, you know, the, the topic of our panel is strength in numbers and talking about partnering in new ways. I mean, are there things that you're doing differently um, in your partnership on hyperimmune globulin or any other partnerships that you're doing that you can, you know, during this pandemic is just totally not the normal way that you do things. Maybe walk us through how this is working. Pompey, do you want to start? Sure. Um, I, I think, you know, we're a blood collector. So our focus is typically uh, the, the on the donor, collecting from a safe donor, uh, manufacturing it to ensure potency and then distributing it. I think one of the ways that we're working differently is that we're working closely with the FDA and um, testing institute because we want to understand uh, what these uh, titers that, uh, or, you know, uh, assays that we're using to assess these convalescent plasma, which are typically just antibody, and we can get a signal to cutoff ratio, what, how these signal to cutoff ratios actually translate into neutralization titers. In addition, um, we are working much more closely with hospitals because they have the clinical data. And so, uh, so sometimes rather than, you know, go through Mayo Clinic, uh, as sort of an intermediary, uh, we have begun to 
work very closely with large hospital groups um, to share our donor and our you know, signal to cutoff ratio data and our neutralization tighter data and directly understand what the clinical impact are. And hopefully some of those studies will come to fruition. And I think they can really add to uh, the body of data that are out there. Yeah, I think I think on the uh, um, the consortium, uh, the COVID, we call it the COVID-19 Alliance, where multiple plasma companies are working together to bring uh, plasma in from all of their different collection operations into a couple of manufacturing operations, and then having a single product come out that's unbranded that all the companies then distribute. That's really never happened before, and and, and I think it's a great um, illustration of. Uh, a sensible approach um, that was initiated by industry to to work in a smarter way that would get um, uh, product available to to patients who need it as fast as much faster than than might have otherwise been possible. And Pompey, I just wanted to return to you on the randomized controlled trial question. Um, we know the recovery trial is testing convalescent plasma. Do you think that's going to be the first randomized data we see on convalescent plasma, or do you think we'll see it from another? trial, you know, what are you expecting and what kind of timing do you think we should be expecting on getting that data? Um, you know, I really can't speak to it because I don't know how fast each of these trials is enrolling. Um, I think that's a big barrier. Uh, you know, a lot of the trials, for example, uh, you know, one of the randomized control trials that I'm thinking of was in New York City. And really, by the time that trial got up and running, uh, the the surge had left New York, uh, leaving, you know, enrollment just uh, really, really slow and very poor. Um, I think I don't have have a handle on how these two trials are enrolling. I think that's going to be the crux of it is being able to enroll robustly. Um, so I, I suspect that if we do get a second wave or another surge in the fall, that's going to help, right? Um, but on the other hand, with the EUA status, that certainly does uh, put somewhat of a barrier in enrollment for these randomized control trials. A sort of scientific question here. Somebody asked me this once, and I'm curious to know your all of your thoughts on this. If uh, convalescent plasma does turn out to be you know, very useful in these randomized controlled trials, and if vaccines like yours, Stefan, or others are very successful, as we saw in the earlier trials at generating you know, these antibodies, could vaccinees be a new source of donating convalescent plasma? Or Jeeve, you're nodding. <laughs> Help me understand this. Absolutely, uh, and and this has um, this is a an approach that has been used in some uh, biodefense, antitoxin, and um, uh, hyperimmune serum approaches uh, in, in in the past. It's been tried in in, in influenza after vaccination, and uh, it is an approach that multiple parties have proposed uh, to us to to consider as a a source of donor plasma. Um, importantly, and and just to state the obvious, you need to first know that the vaccine mediated protection is, is working. And, uh, and, and once you've shown that and you have to have your phase three efficacy trial data to, to know that, then you could begin to pursue this approach of, of having uh, vaccinated individuals donate plasma. I agree with everything Rajiv has said. Um, at this time, the FDA has made it very clear that any uh, convalescent plasma donor that receives a vaccine is ineligible to donate. Uh, we're hoping that as data comes out on efficacy, um, that you know the theoretical uh, argument to use these donors makes you know very strong. It's a strong rationale to use them, right? So we're hoping that the landscape changes and the FDA regulations change as we understand that these vaccines are indeed efficacious. I just also want to add that you know oh I. I believe that there's really no single bullet. Whether we have a very effective vaccine, um, hyperimmune globulin or monoclonal antibodies, I think we're, that doesn't necessarily mean that convalescent plasma will be utterly useless. Uh, I think that it's unlikely that any one of these therapies will be immediately available. Um, to the large numbers of, of people who are affected and that these various modalities uh, should and need to be available uh, as we sort of navigate where this pandemic is going. Well, speaking about where this pandemic is going, Stefan, I want to ask you about something that Pompey just mentioned, of course, with that New York clinical trial. And as you know, cases died down there, enrollment and trials slowed. 
Well, we're in a position now where unfortunately cases are rising again in the US. I mean, how has this affected your trial enrollment? And if anything, your expectations about when you might have enough events or infections uh, to see the data? Yes, that's a good question, Meg. So basically our teams working very closely with uh, the team at NIAD spent most of July as we were gearing up, as you know, to the start of the phase three on July 27 to choose the sites. And we are literally looking at the epidemiology by zip codes. Uh, and that was very helpful so far. We are you know, modeling uh, very regularly, uh, almost too often, uh, kind of when do we think we're going to get to a 53 or 53rd case. Uh, it, it's still a moving target because, again, depending on what you assume for efficacy, the dates move as well. That's why it's kind of complicated modeling uh, because you have both the event rate and the efficacy. But so, what are you uh, assuming for efficacy? If you have a good, I mean, as you know, in the design of a study, we assume 60% to be conservative, to not miss the endpoint. Um, but if you are way higher than 60%, it could be in the early part of November. If the, if the, the infection rate, the attack rate uh, continues as it is, uh, if not, it might be in the in the later part of November. But that's a piece that's a bit hard to know. With two variables moving at the same time, uh, it's hard to guess precisely. Uh, I see. I, I'm actually wondering, Rajiv, if I can put you in a bit of a spot. Um, you know, as somebody who is not involved in the trials directly, but somebody who has a lot of experience in this space and obviously runs a business unit um, in vaccines, when you saw the protocols, um, did you think that it was good that you know so many looks are being taken at the data, interim looks? Pfizer, for example, is taking four. I think that's the most. Somebody has described that as opening the oven and looking at the bread while the the trials going on. Uh, at the risk of awkwardness, with Stefan listening right here, tell me what you think of his protocol. Stefan, just uh, stop listening for a moment, if you would. I want to speak candidly. So, uh, so look, I, I, there, there. I don't want to. I, I'm not going to specifically comment on any any company's protocols, but I will say that there is a statistical approach here that uh, balances out the desire to take a lot of looks because all things being equal, everybody would want to look as frequently as possible to know whether you have efficacy. But there is this concept. Um, which I'm not going to explain, called spending alpha, uh, which is a, a concept that every time you take a look, you pay a statistical price, which means that at the end of the study, when you actually do your final analysis, you have to have a much more robust, uh, much more robust data supporting efficacy than if you would if you had never taken a look. And so, um, without again, without getting into the details, because I'm not the guy to explain that kind of thing, there there is a trade-off that um, that biostatisticians supporting clinical trial design have to take into consideration. But let's not, let's not um, immediately jump to the, the you know, uh, inappropriate motivations. I mean, the reality is here that we need to get a vaccine available uh, you know, to people as quickly as possible. And there are some you know, positives of having um, inter interim analyses as a concept so that you don't have to wait until the end of the, um, the, the period of you know, the follow-up observation period and can get vaccine to people faster, um, particularly given the, the ongoing toll that, that this is taking. So I hope that uh, I hope I didn't offend anybody in that. Uh, it's just the way it works. I, one other quick comment, uh, Pompey. I did look it up while we were talking. I'm sorry, Meg. I I, just, I was distracted for 30 seconds. Um, so the the hyperimmune trial involves hospitalized individuals, symptoms less than 12 days, um, but requiring hospitalization. Pompey, you're right. It's not critically ill patients. So this is upstream of the critically ill, but it's all subjects over the age of 18. Yeah. And maybe uh, Meg, just to add one piece to what Rajiv said is the interim analysis, I think, are also important because we should not forget there are 15,000 participants in our study that are getting placebo. African-Americans, elderly, people with diabetes, people that are by definition at high risk. That's why we needed those people to understand how well the vaccine worked for them. If, again, the vaccine were to be with a high efficacy, think about several more months to get to your final endpoint where you leave them on placebo and you take a risk of them having severe disease, them getting hospitalized, some potential of them dying. And that's the trade-off we are trying as an industry, working with the FDA uh, to do the best job we can because we're trying to solve a lot of variable, a lot of things at the same time. And there's no perfect formula, but we're all trying to figure out with a lot of unknowns, like the attack rate, like the efficacy of the vaccines, 
especially in subpopulations. How do you conduct a study that will inform you in a very rigorous scientific way with placebo control, but at the same time, you do it ethically for those participants? And so just to quickly follow up on that question, does that mean that if you show great efficacy and the safety data are good by that 53rd event, I mean, the first interim look you're taking, you would switch everybody in the trial over from placebo to vaccine and not get the rest of the data? So I will go back to what I said to you on another question earlier. It will depend on the data. And again, if I take extremes, yes, if you know, 98% of the elderly don't get disease, it's going to be really hard to live for several more months you know, thousands of elderly on placebo knowingly. That makes sense. There's also a story out um, today uh, about diversity in your trial, Stefan, uh, and, you know, something that you had told me maybe a month ago that you had to slow down enrollment in order to ensure diversity. Um, tell us about the effect that that's had and uh, do, you, do you feel you have enough diverse representation in the trial? Yes, so indeed, uh, as you know, Meg, because we spoke about it, we decided to slow down the study, uh, which is never uh, an easy decision to make for any team, for any uh, pharmaceutical, you know, uh, clinical study. And it was because uh, if you look at the study we were doing in our minority very well in the Latino Latinx group, but we were doing similar to other trials for vaccines for the Black African American uh, community. Uh, historically, as Rajiv and many know, it has been hard to recruit in that community. And we were not happy because it was just too low. And so what we did basically, we slowed down enrollment in terms of number of people that we were getting every week. We focused on uh, the sites that were doing a great job at minorities. And if you look at the data of last week, uh, we had half of the participant enrolled last week were Hispanic and Latino, 26% were uh, Black or African American. Uh, and so we're getting into a very good place now. Remember, this is a 30,000 uh, participant study. So when you start looking at the statistics, uh, we feel very good about where the study is going to end up. You know, Meg, I, I think we, we just have to, in this forum, acknowledge what uh, Stefan is alluding to, which is that the pandemic is not having equal impact on different populations. It's massively inequitable. Um, and that's just within the United States. Globally, it's even more inequitable. But in the United States alone, there are big differences between between uh, racial groups and, uh, and, and with a, a much a disproportionate incidence in ethnic minorities. And so I think it's so important to have data in, in specific populations, particularly those that are greatest in, that have the greatest impact. Stefan, I have one more for you and then I'll let you breathe again. Um, you know, <laughs> some colleagues of mine at CNBC.com wrote a story, I think it was last week, time has no meaning anymore, but they interviewed five uh, participants in Moderna's and Pfizer's cl vaccine clinical trials. And, and uh, they noted, they don't know if they're on placebo or vaccine, obviously, but after the second shot, they felt very ill, high fever. All of these went away in a couple of days. But um, what can you tell us about what you've observed in the trials so far uh, along the safety and tolerability lines, what this experience is gonna be like for people? Yes, uh, and if you look at the two paper we published in the New England Mail on the healthy adult uh, on July 14, and I think last week, uh, September 29, uh, on the elderly group, uh, it's very consistent, which is on the second dose, on the boost, because you basically attack the immune system a second time uh, to provide more antibodies. We see usually you know, up to a log more antibodies, which is a lot, 10 times more antibody in somebody's blood within a few days. And then we hope for longer duration. So we think this is going to provide longer duration. And what you see is you have, you have a bit more of side effects, not in all the participants. Uh, so a bit of fever, a bit of fatigue, especially in the elderly group, you see a bit more fatigue, which is not surprising. You know, somebody with 65 or 70 or 75 years old. But as you say, there was no severe adverse event, which of course is really important. Uh, and they were all self-resolving within 24, 48 hours maximum. So we'll have to see the totality of the data. I have personally not seen any safety data for the phase three yet. Of course, the safety committee does that for a living uh, on our behalf. Uh, but the only data I have is the one that you have seen now is the, the, the two phase one for uh, uh, young adult and the elderly that have been all published. And I think you will see similar things with bigger N. Uh, if you look at all the vaccines, as you know, this is the 10th vaccine Moderna has put in clinical study. 
we always see a little bit more uh, immunogenicity, sorry, uh, uh, side effects at the boost versus the prime, which I think is consistent with over vaccine technology as well, Rajiv, uh, as you look at things. Um, and uh, it's always self-resolving and, and so far, knock on wood again for what I've seen, no severe, serious adverse events. Pompey, I want to ask you a question. It, it seems like I'm jumping around a lot, but it's a question I, I had for you at the start and haven't gotten to ask you yet, um, which is just, can you describe, you know, what the the experience is like for somebody going to donate blood now in a pandemic? Um, and, you know, how much has that fallen off? Um, and what happens, you know, people, do, do you get an antibody test if you donate blood with the Red Cross? Do you get to find out if you, you know, had COVID and might have protection? Just tell us about what that process is like. Sure. Um, because of COVID uh, and, you know, the stay-at-home mandates, uh, we've lost hundreds of thousands of units uh, that we failed to collect with the stay-at-home mandates. Um, it took a lot of partnering with uh, public health officials, Surgeon General came out on our behalf to say donating blood is safe. Um, to meet, uh, to ensure that that is indeed the case, we put in a number, number of measures, right? All uh, donations are scheduled, you can't walk in. Um, you know, the, the beds are spaced six feet apart. Uh, the protect, uh, everyone is wearing masks. Uh, there are other protective measures to ensure that process is as safe as possible. Um, uh, so right now uh, we uh, continue uh, to struggle uh, to meet hospital demand uh, just because a lot of where we collected blood traditionally, which are with uh, sponsors, with companies, where we've gone and set up and, and employees have come in and donated, uh, people are still working from home. And so those opportunities have uh, diminished as well as educational drive. So 25% of our blood came from um, schools, uh, going to universities and schools. And so uh, those restrictions have really um, uh, eliminated many of those collections. So we are continuing to be innovative and reimagining uh, the, the blood donation process. Uh, nevertheless, uh, we uh, are continuing to encourage everyone who's eligible to roll up their sleeves and come on in, whether you're a convalescent plasma donor or not, uh, all patients win. Um, uh, and, and people really are coming in and, and, and uh, answering that call. Um, you are correct. Uh, we are uh, doing a COVID-19 antibody test on all blood donors. Um, we have a process for ensuring uh, that that antibody test is indeed a true positive and not a false positive uh, because the prevalence of COVID-19 is still fairly low uh, in our country overall. Um, we have an algorithm of testing that we, we do. <clears throat> and then we inform that donor of the results. And then we can also convert that unit uh, if uh, all of these tests do come back positive, uh, including the full algorithm into a convalescent plasma unit. That is fascinating. Um, I'm just about one minute away. So with my final question, I'm going to go to you, Rajiv. Um, you know, we haven't talked about the equitable distribution of a vaccine if we are lucky enough to get one. You're involved with CEPI. The United States has not joined the, the world's, you know, sort of equitable vaccine uh, distribution plan. Do you think we should? Um, do you think, do you have an expectation that, uh, you know, we'll be able to both supply equitably in the United States and around the world? In 30 seconds. Yeah, well, the U.S. should. And my understanding is the National Academies have, have recommended this. And that, and I believe there is a, a funding that has been, that's being committed uh, to, to COVAX, which is the financing facility to make vaccines available to all developing countries, as well as what we call self-paying countries, which are going to reserve a uh, supply of vaccine, that is vaccines that are currently in development. I think this is the first time in history where we've had a, a health or, or medical or any commodity for that matter that has been in demand everywhere around the world. Everyone is going to want the first doses of the scarce resource when they become available. And COVAX is the first time in history we've come up with a mechanism that has the potential to make sure that every country gets a portion of those first doses. Now, what needs to be worked out is how much that's going to be, but everyone is it, that's working on this is very, very focused on the concept of, of, of equity and my hope is that coming out of this, we will have a new standard for equitable access that will apply to any and all products and technologies that come forward in the future. 
So my 30 seconds reference was worrying that we were going to run out of time and I haven't been officially wrapped yet. So I'm going to follow up with you on that. Can COVAX work without the United States, China and Russia joining, which is the current situation, I believe? It can work and it will work without the US, China and Russia if they choose not to join. It would be great to have them act actively involved, but, uh, but honestly, my opinion only, they're not needed because we, uh, there, there are over 190 countries that have committed to COVAX. That's enough. Now, now, even though there may not be specific funds coming in from the US, China, Russia, these are vaccine manufacturing countries. And, and certainly in the US, the standards that are being applied to licensing a vaccine and the data to support it are relevant for the entire world. So even though I wanna point out that even though the US has not yet put significant financial resources into COVAX, the in-kind contribution of doing these massive phase three clinical trials in tens of thousands of subjects across multiple products in areas where there's active disease, which I call the, the storm chaser approach, uh, is incredible. And it's that data is going to help everybody in the world to understand which platforms work, which vaccines work, and, and, and assure them of safety. So it's a, it's a massive in-kind contribution that's being made uh, by the U.S., a financial contribution would be a lot of icing on the cake, but I think already there is a, a very real tangible contribution that's been made. All right. Well, that's a very interesting perspective, and I love that storm chaser terminology. I believe we are out of time. I hope I'm not leaving any extra time on the table, but this has been a fantastic uh, panel, and, and thank you all you know, for all of your thoughts. Thanks for being here. Thanks, Meg. Thanks, Meg. Thanks, Pampi. Thanks, Roger. Thank you. Thanks, Stefan.